what is up and welcome back to beyond the arc with brandon silvers as always i am your host brandon silvers we're talking women's march madness today going to try to figure out who is going to win the national championship but first hope y'all had a great week glad to be talking to you again all right let's get into it Okay, this has been an awesome year for women's hoops from South Carolina's undefeated season heading into the tournament to Caitlin Clark's scoring record chase to LSU trying to defend its title to all these incredible freshmen playing out of their minds. The perfect combination of great storylines and great basketball. And we still have this entire tournament left where we get even more great storylines and great basketball. Who should we be paying attention to Who's going to win it all? There are more great teams than ever, but it's still a safe bet to assume the champion is going to be a top three seed. No team worse than a three seed has ever won the title, at least not in the NCAA era. In fact, no team worse than a three seed has made the final four since 2016. That year, seventh seeded Washington, led by WNBA All-Star Kelsey Plum, and fourth seeded Syracuse, led by one of the best defenders in the WNBA today, Brittany Sykes, made the final four, but Brianna Stewart and UConn won it all to cap off their perfect season. With that in mind, I'm going to focus on the teams with the best chances to win it all and sprinkle in some knowledge on some other contenders so you can sound smart and also know what games to pay attention to since we can't watch them all, although I might try. Let's start in the Albany one quadrant or Albany as L. Duncan kept saying during the selection show. I would love for the NCAA to just name the quadrants after geographical regions like they do with the men's bracket, but when have they ever done anything that makes sense? The number one seed here is the South Carolina Gamecocks. We should never Stop talking about the job Don Staley has done this year, losing all that talent from last year's squad, all five starters, just to turn around and again not lose a single game heading into the tournament is unbelievable. They're my favorite to win it all. It's hard to pick against a team we have not seen lose, and they're a better all-around team than last year's Final Four squad. The biggest reason for that is three-point shooting. Last year, they shot just 31% as a team, which allowed opposing teams to pack the paint. Iowa did this when they beat them in the Final Four, and we have that now infamous image of Caitlin Clark waving off Raven Johnson, daring her to shoot, even though she was the only player hitting threes in that game for South Carolina. Good luck with that strategy this season, as they are third in the country at just under 40% from three, Oregon transfer to Hina Pow Pow is one of the best shooters in the nation, hitting 47%. Freshman Tessa Johnson is right behind her at 45%. And Bree Hall checks in at exactly 40% from three. Raven Johnson is respectable enough to make you pay if you leave her open, even you, Iowa. And Malaysia Full Wiley has improved as the season has gone on to the point where you shouldn't leave her open either. She can be streaky, but those streaks are becoming more hot than cold. They can spread the floor this year, but they still have imposing post players, starting with Camilla Cardoso. She isn't quite as skilled as Aaliyah Boston, but how many players are? She's one of the best post players in the nation. She's going to be one of the top picks in the upcoming WNBA draft, has done a great job at replacing Boston using her 6'7 frame to impose her will down low, and they can pair her with any combination of Ashlyn Watkins, Chloe Kitts, or Sanaya Fagan. Watkins is the most athletic post player in the country, and Kitts is a fantastic playmaker, especially out of the high post. They have so many options offensively and so much depth. It gives Dawn the ability to mix and match based on how the game is going. And the last thing you want to do is give Dawn Staley options. Where they sometimes get themselves into trouble is by forcing the ball into the post. Cardoso doesn't always establish a strong base when she posts up, which can cause her to be forced into bad angles by stronger post defenders. This can lead to awkward shot attempts that miss. Usually their offensive rebounding can cancel that out, but when it doesn't, it can lead to the offense grinding to a halt especially if you aren't allowing them to get out and run in transition. The remedy for this is almost always Malaysia Full Wiley. She's a master at creating something out of nothing, whether that means forcing a turnover on the defensive end so they can get out and run, or breaking down a defender off the dribble and getting to the hoop, she just makes things happen. She's an absolute superstar. She came out the gate with a highlight film performance against Notre Dame the first game of the season, but she's an even better basketball player now. 
Her jumper is more consistent. She's better at taking what the defense gives her and not forcing the action. And she's light years better as a defender than she was when the season started, both on the ball and off it. She had 24 points in 17 minutes in that wild SEC championship game against LSU and went home with the tournament MVP as a result. Someone a little bit less flashy, but just as important to this team's success is the aforementioned Raven Johnson. She slid into that starting point guard role and is the tone setter on both ends of the court. She doesn't put up huge scoring numbers and operates more as a throwback to the traditional point guard days, but she plays that role impeccably. I cannot mention her without also talking about her rebounding prowess, 11 straight games of at least five rebounds. She's doing that as a point guard who plays alongside several other amazing rebounders, which is another testament to her ability to dedicate herself to the finer details of the game that lead to wins. I've spent all this time talking about the Gamecocks' many offensive options because we take defense for granted with them, but they're once again elite defensively. They allow four and a half fewer points per game than last year's team that was rightfully considered a defensive juggernaut. Cardoso and Watkins are two of the best shot blockers in the country. They all rebound well. They force turnovers that lead to easy buckets. Bree Hall has really stepped up as a wing defender. It will basically take a perfect storm to beat them, one we haven't seen yet and have only seen once in two years. They aren't unbeatable. They've had some close calls, but they have every aspect of the game needed to beat any opponent they may face. Coaching, offense, defense, everything. So that's why they're my pick to win it all. The Notre Dame Fighting Irish are the two seed in the Albany One quadrant. An amazing season for them, especially since their missing star Olivia Miles, who hasn't played at all while she's still recovering from a knee injury. The story here is obviously freshman sensation Hannah Hidalgo, an unreal stat line of 23 points, six rebounds, five and a half assists, and four and a half steals per game. Four and a half steals. Her performance not only all season long, but especially in the ACC tournament, which Notre Dame won, was legendary. Like South Carolina, they also have a fantastic coach in Neil Ivey, who has figured out how to build around a freshman in Hildago and win without a superstar in Miles. If they were in any other region, I'd probably be picking them to go to the Final Four. Not only does Hidalgo have the individual brilliance to carry them, but they also have other great players. Sonia Citron is tough as nails and can score in a variety of ways. She puts up nearly 17 points per game. And would you look at that? Maddie Westbelt is also tough as nails and can score in a variety of ways and is a monster on the glass too, averaging 14 points and nine boards. How many players can get you nine rebounds and also shoot 37% from three on good volume. My concern with them is who else besides Maddie can battle it out in the post, both offensively and defensively, especially now that Kylie Watson just announced she'll be missing the entire tournament with a torn ACL. Guard skill and depth are through the roof, and women's college basketball is a guard-centric game. Hidalgo is one of the best players, not just guards, in the country, but you do have to have an inside presence to win it all, especially if we assume they'll have to face South Carolina at some point. They lost to the Gamecocks by 29 to open the season, and they're certainly a better team now, so I wouldn't expect a similar result if they do match up again, but I also don't think that they can beat them at this point either. As far as other teams in this region that could make some noise, three-seed Oregon State is incredibly well-rounded. Talia Van Allerhofen kind of embodies that team's well-roundedness. They defend well. Reagan Beers is a double-double machine who at times looks impossible to stop in the post. They're experienced. They know what they want to do and consistently execute at a high level. And as you would assume in the NCAA tournament, there's a lot of individual talent here as well. But on paper, this quadrant doesn't offer any real challenges to a team that's as talented, deep, battle-tested, and well-coached as South Carolina. That will do it for this region's bracket preview. Feel free to respectfully agree or disagree in the comments below. Be sure to check out my other bracket previews as well and tap into my blog, the show notes for more coverage. Information for that is in the show notes down below. Appreciate you watching, listening, rating, subscribing, reviewing, and sharing. And I will catch you later.